Chapter 8, Business Cycles. This is a super, super interesting chapter. So, so far in the first seven chapters, we have seen the classical model or classical way of looking at macroeconomics. This chapter is the bridge chapter after which we will see the K Keynesian, Keynesian model, right? Um, and the bridge chapter is called business cycles because every business or every country goes through these cycles, cycles of expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. But as you can see, it keeps going up, right? Overall, it's going up, but there are these cycles. These cycles, when, when, when there is optimism, there is expansion. And when there is pessimism, there is contraction. And so this human tendency of uh, greed and fear. So when there's lots of greed, there's lots of expansion, lots of optimism, people invest. And then there is fear, so people sell. And so overall, these emotions um, of how human beings feel about the state of the economy and how people invest in the economy drives these cycles. That's just one part. But there are many reasons why there is expansion and contraction. And we're going to look at just all of those reasons as to what causes this. Right? What, what causes this? Why not just have like a, a straight line that goes up like this, right? Wouldn't that be great if we, if we know everything is just fine, uh, it just keeps growing, the country keeps growing, the businesses keep doing well, but it, it doesn't because of various reasons. And one of the key reasons I feel is, is this emotions around optimism and pessimism and that, that we keep fluctuating in that. So let, let's look at the United States. This is the history of the United States as to what happened, right? So in the 19... Uh, in 1873 to 1879, right, almost 65 months, this was the biggest period of contraction in the United States, right? Almost six years. Right? Bank, bank collapses were the major reason when one uh, institution failed to pay back to its uh, depositors and then it lead, led to a series of these banks collapsing. And so then people didn't have their own money back. They gave money to the bank, but they didn't have their money back. And so those that major collapse of the banks eventually led to the creation in the 19, 19, 1907 in the Federal Reserve, where the FDIC and other insurances were established. Um, exiting World War I, the United States was uh, the most strongest compared to everyone. Uh, in the in the globe and so but it didn't it didn't stay that way the contraction with FDIC got some stability but then we saw a great depression 1929 to 1930s right followed by World War II so World War One, World War II and during the Great Depression average inflation minus 10 percent that means prices were going down so it's deflation also unemployment went up almost 25 percent during this period of World War II. There was, post that, lots of expansion in the economy following World War II, but then look at look what happened. The expansion did create 5% average GDP growth, which was huge, but then it also eventually in the 1970s led to 14% inflation, where the prices keep going up. And then in the, seven, in the end of the 70s and 80s, we saw the oil shocks, the oil prices went up, almost four times. And so then unemployment went up 8% again. So you see unemployment, inflation, they go up and down uh, due to various shocks, various events that happen in the system. The Federal Reserve to end this high period of uninflation, uh, high period of inflation of 14% uh, made a huge re repo rate change wherein they increased the interest rate. When they increased the interest rate, Inflation went down, but unemployment went up again, 10%. So it went from 8 to 10, made it worse, right? Inflation did go down, interest rate went up. So all of these activities and interventions caused the change in the system. 
from 90, 91 to 2007, which is called the great moderation period, where it felt like, you know, we the business cycles are coming to the end, right? Except 2001, where we saw a brief one year period of uh, contraction. But this period, right, almost 15 years, where we saw GDP volatility, um, inflation volatility, unemployment volatility go down almost 30, 35%. Overall GDP did go down, inflation went down, and unemployment rate also went down. So this is that period of great moderation. And then in 2007, that's when uh, we had the Great Recession, almost 10% unemployment. So the unemployment kept varying. And due to various events, various events, we see that the, the country overall also has this expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. Overall, it's, it's, it's going in the top right, meaning it's going in the positive towards the right. Uh, so it's growing, but it has these cycles. And so there are these two really good websites called nebr.org and Conference Board. They look at a lot of these variables like inflation, unemployment, uh, GDP, and then they try to predict in ex ante, like in, in uh, before the events happen, as to what's going to happen. So they've already said in February 2020 was the peak, right? The stock market has been keeping on going up. So we look at like, why is that? But like they have the latest uh, shared February 2020 as the peak of GDP growth. We've seen contraction coming through. So high level, we went through the history of the United States to just understand that there are various events that happen, bank collapses. Why do the banks collapse, right? There's gotta be some aspect around fear and greed. It, it's gotta be some aspect around overestimating what would be the need, uh, over lending in case of 2007 and 2009. So this human emotion of fear and greed, I believe, is, is one of the key reasons why the globe goes through these cycles. And so we saw with the United States example through various data points that there are these cycles where unemployment goes up and down, GDP goes up and down, inflation goes up and down, right? So this expansion and contraction of economic activity is called a business cycle. And then this applies not just to a business or an industry, but also applies to the country. It also applies to the globe overall. Different countries have these cycles as well. If we know these cycles, and if we know the variables that govern these cycles, then we can make better financial judgments around where we are in the cycle. What should we be doing? Should we be doubling down on our investment? Should we be not investing? And so on and so forth. So what are some of the variables, right, for all of this? So there are three different variables we saw, right? We saw unemployment. We saw inflation, um, we also saw interest rate, right? But there are many such variables. And that's what these two companies, nebr.org, it's a nonprofit conference board, they look at all of these variables that drive this, this uh, prediction towards like where we are in a given cycle. Are we at the peak or are we just starting to grow or are we at the bottom, right? So that's what uh, is pretty helpful. But these variables, can be classified in two different ways. It can be classified as pro-cyclical, counter-cyclical, and acyclical. Based, this categorization is based on the nature of their movement. The nature of their movement, which basically means if my GDP goes up or my output goes up, do these variables, pro-cyclical variables, are the variables that also goes up, meaning they are in the same direction. GDP goes up, my pro-cyclical variables goes up. Counter-cyclical is basically saying my GDP goes up, but my pro-cyclical variable goes down. Acyclical is basically, it can go up or down, right? So the variables can be classified, and these are the variables that we will look at, but a variable can be classified as pro-cyclical, counter-cyclical, which is it, it moves in the opposite direction of GDP, or acyclical. And it could be based on the time. This is the nature categorization, and this is basically time categorization. Do these variables like unemployment, inflation, bond yield spread, do they move ahead of time of GDP or do they move behind of time, right? So do they are they a leading indicator or a lagging indicator or they're just coincidental, meaning you can flip a coin and that's what it is, right? 
So let's look at some examples of macroeconomic variables as to how they impact GDP and how they tell us where we are in this cycle. So now we know that there's cycles, but now we, we need to find out where are we? If we want to find out we are here, then we need to look at a bunch of these variables and they can tell us where we could be, right? So let's look at consumer spending. If the overall consumer spending, this is the demand, if the overall consumer spending goes up, right, then this uh, is a pro-cyclical, meaning it goes in the same direction. If consumer spending goes up, GDP goes up. Right? So there's a, there's a pro-cyclical, they move in the same direction. Similarly, investment spending. When people invest more, the output will go up, right? So the GDP go up. So pro-cyclical again. Unemployment. Unemployment rate, if the GDP is doing well, unemployment will be down, right? So it is counter-cyclical, meaning less people will be unemployed. Inflation, when GDP is going up or output is going up, inflation will potentially go up, right? So this is uh, pro-cyclical. Why would inflation go up if GDP goes up, right? More and more goods are produced. If 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 we if we see that the aggregate uh, supply remains same, but if the demand for it goes up, then the prices go up. When prices go up, inflation goes up, right? So it's pro-cyclical. Stock market index. Based on the data in the textbook, it's acyclical. So it can go up or down. Um, I, I, I have seen the stock market uh, typically, um, yeah, I think that's the right conclusion. It's acyclical. You cannot conclude based on the stock market movement whether the GDP will go up or down. Spread between long-term and short-term government bonds. So the treasury yield, this is counter. So this is a good one. If the yields go down, meaning it's easy to borrow, people will borrow and then the GDP will go up because they'll borrow and then they'll invest in machinery, they'll pay in wages, they'll go up, counter. Similarly, spread interest rates between the corporate and government bonds. This is also counter, right? If, uh, if the, the difference, which is the spread between interest rate of the corporation and the government bond yield or the treasury goes down, GDP goes up, cheaper to borrow for the corporations as well. So now we know what, what direction they move in. Pro-cyclical, counter-cyclical, acyclical. Now let's look at the timing. Do they move ahead of the GDP? Do they move behind of the GDP? Or there's no such thing, right? Consumer spending is coincidental. I thought this would be like a leading indicator, but based on data, this is coincidental. Investment spending is also coincidental. So unemployment is also coincidental. I think unemployment is a lagging indicator, but, but uh, based on data, you cannot really conclude. So it's coincidental. Inflation is a lagging indicator. So inflation goes up and down after the fact. So this is clearly a lagging indicator, right? So coincidental, you have to discount. Leading and lagging is what you are really in, looking at. So the spread between government bond yields, this is a leading indicator. And it's a counter leading indicator. I mean, this is a really good proxy of how the economy is doing, right? Stock market is also coincidental. So. I had a belief that stock market is a leading indicator, but it looks like it, it's, it's coincidental because it would have predicted many more recessions because of the temporary downs where it's not the case. So it's actually coincidental, but I think it's a, I, I would bias it towards coincidental major, but minor leading. Similarly, unemployment, I would say it's a lagging, but indicator, but uh, by data it's coincidental. Spread between interest rate for corporation government bonds, it's coincidental. So that's another key thing. You have to discount this over the government bond spread rate differences. So just look at long and short for government, and that's the best leading indicator, and it's a counter of how the economy is doing. Right? And so, so the second big one is this inflation. Right? Look at this. It's, it's not coincidental. Anything that's not coincidental, that's good, because then it, it means either it's leading or lagging, right? 
So you typically can benefit from leading indicators. So bond yields are, are really good. They, they move in the opposite way and then they are leading indicators. That's why it's important to understand bonds and how they work because they are counter variables in terms of predicting uh, how the economy is doing and then they are leading indicators. Great, so now we've looked at different examples of uh, macroeconomic variables. We've classified them in the nature, also classified them in their time. And so when these variables change, we know that they will change the output or the GDP. When they change the output, we know, hey, if, if, uh, if we know, let's say, let's take an example, that uh, the interest rate between long and short government bonds is dropping, right? It's dropping. Then we know that the GDP is going up because it's counter. So when this drops, we know that the output will go up and it's also a leading indicator. So then we know we are in this cycle, the, the, we are in the expansion cycle. But if it goes down, right? If, uh, if, 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 uh, if it goes up, if the spread goes up, meaning it's difficult to borrow, then we know we're gonna to start to see contraction. So there's contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion, right? So now we know certain variables, but there are many such variables. And that's where we have to check out these websites, nebr.org, conference board. They give us many more indicators and look at the ones that are either a leading or a lagging indicator. Um, and we'll have to discount a lot of these coincidental variables quite a bit. Okay, so now we know this. So how is this chapter again the bridge, right? So, so far in the first seven chapters, what we've seen is the long run models, chapter three to seven. And long run models are also called as a classical model, which was invented by Adam Smith. Remember the, the many videos that we've been together? Adam Smith, the invisible hand, all of those things that we covered. So that's what we've covered so far in the first seven videos, which is this long run models. But now at this juncture and going beyond, we now know that uh, we need to look at a different type of model called the short run models, which is also called as Keynesian models, which was uh, uh, named after this guy, John Keynes. Um, and there are differences between these models. So let's look at what are the differences. And chapter nine to 13 is Keynesian model, but let's quickly revise what we've seen already so far. And what are some of the variables that we've looked at, right? So we know that the demand curve is downward sloping to the right and supply is upward sloping to the right, right? But when we think about price and real GDP, if we were to assume that everyone in the world is working and that no one is slacking, then you can assume that there is a fixed amount of supply and let's say everyone's employed. So then instead of a curve that goes like this, we can have a fixed line, right? Because everyone's employed and uh, everyone's fully employed and, and, and we are at a point where we are like, we cannot produce more, meaning we are running the factories at 100% capacity, everyone's employed, 100% utilization. In that case, what we assume is that there is a, typically what we've seen so far is this, this kind of curve, right? where we have aggregate supply that goes up, aggregate demand that goes down. But now let's take this forward a little bit, right? Where we say, hey, if everyone's, the best case scenario is that aggregate supply is a straight line, meaning everyone's employed 100% utilization. But we've seen how the prices change. The prices change when the demand, let's say, goes up. If the demand goes up, what would happen? The demand curve, as we've seen in the previous videos, shifts to the right. And when it shifts to the right, the prices would go up. So it'll go from P1 to P2. You've seen all of this in the past videos I'm going through quickly, but the key is output is dependent as a function of capital and labor. You've seen that. Um, and the model assumes that interest rate is, a, is a, interest rate R is a function of investments and savings, how these two operate. And that price are very flexible. The more the demand, the price goes up, inflation goes up, right? And then if less demand, prices go down. And then there's always a clearing price and then they move very quickly. So that's the key assumption that we've seen in the first seven chapters that prices change quickly and that the markets with invisible hand, they, they have a clearing mechanism. So the key thing that this thing helps us, this model helps us is analyzing economic growth. 
right? Because uh, it's, it's trying to say, hey, how does the country grow? We've seen the Cobb Douglas function, which is how it started. Then we've seen the solo model, and that's all part of how do you get growth. And the key focus here is to just focus on reducing inflation, as government should just focus on inflation. That's the key idea here. And the way they do that is through interest rate, right? Like we saw here, the Federal Reserve, they, they changed the interest rate, they upped the interest rate to such a high extent that inflation went down, although it had a huge impact on unemployment. So that's an example. But the key, key, key learning here is that there's supply and demand changes quickly and the price the clearing price changes quickly that's what we've assumed so much so far in the last seven chapters it's all part of the long run analysis the long run this is the long run model what is the definition of a long run versus a short run i still don't know but like long run is and but i have a i have, I have an idea which we can use to clarify what is long run versus short run but long run and short run have different mechanisms. So let's let's look at some example and we get to clarity. So this model by John Bernard Keynes was developed during the 1930s, during this period, when there was depression. And what he observed was that, hey, the demand was going down, the demand was going down, but the prices were not going down. Because let's, let's take an example, let's say, uh, during that depression period, you the demand for the goods went down because people had unemployed, people were unemployed. And so then what happened was they started consuming less. And when they started consuming less, the factory producers, they have a bare minimum cost that they have to cover to be profitable or be in business. So they can reduce the price, but not to certain ex not beyond certain extent. So then what they found was that they couldn't reduce price further. And what he observed was that they were going out of business because they couldn't sell for a loss. And so there was a, a negative spiral. It didn't, there was no clearing mechanism that happened during the Great Depression. And so people became more and more pessimistic and to such an extent that the GDP overall went down. So what he saw was that the aggregate supply curve, if this was the best case, actually dropped. Meaning, and then eventually the clearing price did not drop beyond a certain P, certain price, P star, let's say. And he said that the key observation he has is the prices are actually not changing quickly in certain times like the Great Depression, and that the prices are sticky. And then his assumption and recommendation was that government should have active policies to reduce these fluctuations to increase GDP and reduce unemployment, not just inflation. He's saying, hey, you need to do something like fiscal borrowing, like what we did in 2007, 2009 crisis. There was also tax cuts, meaning the government took on larger role to decrease taxes, increase purchases and investments, and reduce interest rate. Here, it was only about interest rate. Here they're saying monetary policy needs to be active because in the short run, when you are in this where, where you are in this contraction period or when you are in this Keynesian period, so there are three parts. This is the classical period, which we saw here, this period. This is a contraction period where, where it's actually starting to build that spiral, the negative spiral. And then here it's like it's doom and gloom. I mean, everyone's given up. When everyone's given up and when you are in this model, where you are in this state of the economy, John Bernard Keynes was saying, hey, the government at this point needs to stimulate growth. When the economy is much operating much below their GDP potential, let's say it is here or here in this curve, that the government should start to induce growth, induce more into the economy so that there is a positive virtuous loop built. So government should start purchasing, should take less taxes instead of taking more taxes because they don't have enough money to balance the books. So that was the key learning and it came out of analyzing the period of Great Depression which he was going through and he said, hey, the government needs to be much more active, that the prices are sticky, the prices are sticky because first of all, there's the bare minimum that you need to cover the cost, it cannot go down to zero. Second, there's monopoly power. Right? The, 
people will choose to buy certain products because they are that good um, and so and and companies will be not willing to go beyond a certain price so there's monopoly power where they have prices that they can uh, control what prices they sell also it's difficult to change prices regularly like if it if it it it, uh, it can't quickly change because you printed your menus you you advertise you have like brought in customers if you if you, if you bring in customers and then they they see higher or lower prices it doesn't work that way so people typically stagger their prices so unless there is a huge change in market share people typically don't change their prices because the cost of doing that is much higher than the benefit the delta benefit that people will get so so that's the key difference, which is if the if the country is in this GDP curve of aggregate demand, if the demand is falling, then the government through active monetary policies should increase should increase that demand by investing, by buying government as a buyer, by reducing taxes so that more money is in the hands of the people. They can now start spending, and when they spend that person who they are buying from will start to spend and so there's a positive loop being created. So that was the key learning, which is to say, hey, don't just assume that markets will always clear and that it will go down because it will not. At certain point, the doom and gloom, the negative virtuous loop will make it so hard for people to come out of it. And it's only powerful entities like the government who needs, which needs to play an active role to take the country out of this area into this healthy, area of growth if it goes too much into it again that is a problem because the economy will start heating so this is that that's that uh, area where the government needs to focus on how do you get to this level of demand it has to induce that demand so that's the key learning which is which is what we're going to now look at in the next four chapters 9 to 13 we're going to look at how in the short run the prices are sticky for various reasons and that the governments need to play an active role versus here the government's a passive role just controlling the inflation through the central banks right that we've seen this so this advances our understanding so we'll look at in the next four chapters how the short-run models differ we, we also now looked at classifying these uh, variables and why these are important because based on where you are in the business cycle different models can be helpful and the combination of these models can actually be helpful because once let's say you are in the state of uh, of growth and in the countries in, in in the right gdp then the classical model kicks in and works fine so now if you're wondering like hey if you are the united states or if you are india like let's say united states or germany which is developed country versus india which is developing which macroeconomic view should you use so the answer is it depends it depends on what it depends on which which part of the curve you are in the demand side of the equation because just shifting the supply just shifting the supply here right so here in the classical equation we can shift the demand to the right by giving more money or reducing interest rate here we need to look at the supply curve as well right as to where are you in the supply curve if you are at, at the point where the GDP is much below its potential then you need to start thinking, hey, I need to induce growth. So you need to start borrowing. And that works if you are a big country, which is developed, to borrow at a lower cost. But if you are, let's say, India, and your country rating is, is not AAA, then it's going to be expensive for you to borrow. So when you borrow, then the debt goes up, and then the cost of servicing debt also goes up. That increases inflation too. So depending on the country size and depending on the country state and depending on where you are in the supply demand, aggregate supply demand curve, what your GDP is and what your potential is, borrowing might make sense for you based on what is your borrowing cost. So you have to evaluate the borrowing cost, evaluate the benefit that you will get with increased GDP versus using that money to now service your debt. So it's a chicken and egg problem. How countries come out of this is through productivity. We've seen all of that. So the classical is the basis. And then Keynesian is, is what gets you further if you are in the slump period. All right, so business cycles, we got it.